Hello, everyone, and welcome to Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. My name is Heather Osborne, and I'm the Director of Global Events and Programming here at Net Diligence, a cyber assessment and data breach services company. We are pleased to extend our thought leading content into the virtual space with this webinar series. Visit the conferences page on our website, www.netdiligence.com, to find out more about our online and in person programs. Before we begin today, I'd like to extend our gratitude to our virtual cyber risk sponsors and our nearly 100 industry-leading speakers, without whom this program would not be possible. For today's webinar, we will be using the ON24 platform. Right now, you should be viewing the ON24 dashboard, which shows the live viewing screen and other features. During this presentation, all participants will be in listen mode only. Today's presentation will last approximately 60 minutes. Panelists will be taking your questions throughout the presentation. Simply type in your question and hit submit. You may also use this feature for technical questions. In the bottom corner, you will see a widget called Resources, where you can download assets our presenters and sponsors have provided. Just click on the resource and it will be automatically downloaded. If you are interested in receiving CLE or CE credit for today's webcast, please navigate to the CLE CE box in the lower right hand corner to make your selection. This will ensure that you are emailed the CLE CE questionnaire to complete your application for credit. Additionally, please note that you must remain online for the duration of the program and answer the three polling questions that appear during the presentation. As a reminder, this webcast is being recorded. Following the conclusion of this webcast, you will be sent an archive link for further viewing or sharing with colleagues. This webinar will also be available on demand on our website. Again, thank you for joining us here at Net Diligence today. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello everyone, my name is John Donald and I'm a cyber advisor with Axis Capital based in London and my presentation is called 35 Views of Cyber Risk. It's based on a book we've published and you should be able to download a PDF of this book in the supplementary materials on this website or from our Axis website. The book goes into things in much more detail because you have text accompanying the slides that I'm going to show and I'd urge you to go there and download it if you'd like to read the full version of the book. But today, I'm just going to do the presentation, and I'm going to start off by drawing your attention to the picture of the wave on the front cover here. Now, this is an image that most of you probably know well, and you've often seen when people are talking about risk. People use this image of a big wave as a visual metaphor for a sense of risk. But that's not the reason why I'm using it. A lot of people don't know this, but it's not actually a picture of a wave at all. It actually comes from a series of prints called 36 Views of Mount Fuji by Hokusai back in the 1850s in Japan. And the point that Hokusai was trying to make was that in order to understand Japan, you cannot approach it directly. You have to approach it obliquely. So in his series of prints, he always put some sort of vision of Japanese daily life in the foreground, but the unifying principle in the background was always Mount Fuji. Here are three slides from his series. In the foreground, Japanese daily life. In the background, in each case, you can see Mount Fuji in the red circles. Mount Fuji is the spiritual center of Japan, and you need to view it from all angles. So, in order to understand Japan, you have to look at it in 36 different ways, a 360-degree view, if you will. And the same is true of cyber risk. You need to view it in many different ways, through many different lenses, in order to understand it. Hokusai called his series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Mine is called 35 Views of Cyber Risk, one less than the master, in due deference to his genius. But there's another reason why I picked Mount Fuji as the icon I want to talk about, 
and that is that Mount Fuji is a volcano, and it exists because it's at the meeting point of three different tectonic plates. You have the Eurasian plate, the Philippine plate, and the Pacific plate all meeting at one point, and when these tectonic plates grind against each other, that's what produces the volcano. Now, when you think about cyber risk, you also have three plates, conceptual plates, not tectonic ones, and they are IT, security, and insurance. Now, there are lots of people in IT who know about tech but may not know about insurance, and take it from me, there are certainly a lot of people in insurance who don't know that much about IT. But in order to properly understand cyber risk, you need to be at the fusion point between all three of these disciplines. They all use different terms and acronyms. They all have different specialist knowledge. So to properly understand cyber risk, you need to basically dip into all three of these disciplines, technology, security and insurance. And that's what we're going to do as we go through the different slides. And I want to start off here with a slide from the Davos meeting a year ago in 2019. The great and the good gathered together in the World Economic Forum and were asked to rank the risks facing the world economy based on their likelihood and impact. Now, you can see up there in the top left-hand corner, WMDs. So, if a nuclear bomb exploded, it would clearly be a high-impact event, but that likelihood was seen as being small. That's why it's up in the top left corner. If you look at what they were really concerned about, a year ago at least, then you have to look in the top right-hand corner for events that are both high impact and high likelihood. And you can see there are two things up there, and they are climate change and cyber attacks. Just in passing, look at the centre of the chart where you can see the word plague. Niels Bohr, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, was an extremely clever man and one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. But he's also famous for making the following joke. He said, Prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. So we should not judge the Davos guys too harshly for underestimating the coronavirus risk. You can see that the risk of plague is only medium, right in the centre of the chart there. I'm sure when this gets updated, the position of plague will have changed. But back to climate change and cyber in the top right-hand corner. If we consider things from an insurance standpoint, what climate change really means is, basically, property risk or catastrophe risk from hurricanes or earthquakes or bushfires and the like. And from an insurance standpoint, even though property risk and cyber risk are ranked in a similar way with high likelihood and high impact, they're very different types of risks indeed. And on this next chart, I just want to explain why that is. You can see here that property catastrophe risk has only first order complexity, but cyber is a fourth order complexity issue. So when you think of natural catastrophe risk, you're really only dealing in the physical realm because you have a hurricane, that's a physical object, meeting a building, which is another physical object. And you can model that with some fairly sophisticated mathematics, but you're still only dealing in the world of physics. Now, as soon as you add biology, you begin to get a feedback loop. That's what Darwin's evolutionary theory is all about, the feedback. Things basically improve when they come into contact with each other. Environmental pressure causes change. And going up one level to third-order complexity, by adding knowledge into the equation, intelligent creatures can begin to change the environment to their advantage. And by the time you get to the fourth order of complexity, you can see you not only have a feedback loop, but you also have a feed-forward loop in that you have anticipatory intelligence. In other words, people are trying to outthink their opponent before they've even made their move. That's anticipatory intelligence, and that's a fourth-order complex problem. So when you think, for example, of a stock market, that's a fourth-order complex phenomenon. You have buyers and sellers trying to outthink each other, trying to guess what the other person is going to do before they've done it. And in exactly the same way, cyber risk is also fourth-order complex because you have attackers and defenders trying to outsmart each other. So that's one reason why cyber risk and natural catastrophe risk are completely different. 
most of the statistical methods that are used to evaluate risk in the insurance world are based on toolkits that have been borrowed from the world of physics. So probability theory, the bell curve, and statistical significance tests all have their roots in physical science. They rely on observing a historic data set and using that to infer future events, which is analogous to driving with only your rear view mirror. But if you recognize that cyber risk is fourth order complex, then maybe it's time to raid the toolbox of the biologists and the behavioral scientists. A good example is predator prey modeling, which biologists use to predict the changes in populations of, say, foxes and rabbits. A boom in the rabbit population means more food for the foxes. But if the rabbits are overpredated, then the fox population will also fall because there's less food for them. So these predator-prey interactions are inherently cyclical, dynamic, and not static. You can't just use a ruler to straight line extrapolate the future from the past because you're dealing with effectively a sine wave. You need to try to model the rhythm of that cycle. We observe the same thing in the cyber realm, an arms race between the attackers and the defenders, with first one side getting the upper hand and then the other as the advantage seesaws between the two of them. Egregious predation by the attackers results in changed behaviour by the defenders. So, for example, a rise in stolen credentials results in the widespread use of two-factor authentication and so on. Now, most people who attend a cybersecurity conference walk out at the end feeling anxious, depressed or scared or, or maybe all three as they learn about a host of new cyber risks that are looming over the horizon. But I want to inject a note of hope here. Let's take ransomware as an example, a hot topic right now. One of the things we learn from predator-prey modelling is that the cycle is driven by the relative ratio of damage and reward. Imagine a wolf predating on deer. If a wolf kills a deer and only eats a small part of the carcass, say, just a part of the left hind haunch, then the reward to the wolf is small, but the damage to the deer is great. Now, from an evolutionary standpoint, this asymmetry means that the pressure for the deer to change their behaviour is much greater than the pressure on the wolf to change. By the way, there's a great YouTube video on how reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone National Park ended up changing the course of the rivers there because of the changed behaviour by the deer, which I urge you to download and watch. Basically, the deer changed their grazing habits, which meant trees grew in different places, altering the landscape and so on. But OK, let's apply this thinking to a ransomware situation. Typically, the ransom demand is a very small proportion of the overall cost of a ransomware incident. Most of the damage is caused by the interruption to the business and the incident response costs. So we have a big asymmetry between the reward to the predator and the damage to the prey. This would imply, if we use predator-prey modelling, that the cycle is about to change in favour of the prey. There is little pressure for the predator to change behaviour because they are more than satisfied. There's a huge amount of pressure for the prey to change behaviour because of the massive damage which is being done. I don't mean to suggest that we can all be complacent, but we can take some comfort from the fact that the forces of evolution right now are on the side of the prey, the defenders, us. You see, there is hope for all of us yet. To summarise, the first way that cyber risk is different from property risk is that it is fourth-order complex and therefore cyclical, non-linear, dynamic and not static, and could maybe be better analysed with tools from biology and not physics. The second way that they're different is all about the concept of systemic risk. When you think of property risk, the likelihood of a building collapsing in, say, New York, London and Tokyo all at the same time is zero. But when it comes to cyber, the likelihood of a computer system going down in New York, London and Tokyo all at the same time is clearly not zero, because those computers are all connected with each other. And after all, that's the whole point of the internet, that everything is connected, and therefore you have a systemic element to the risk which is much higher. Now you can see on this chart that I've illustrated a typical technology stack. So you have hardware down there at the bottom, and going up through websites and software, 
you go all the way to people at the top. And this is where the systemic risk comes in, because at each level on this technology stack, things are connected. At the bottom layer, you have hardware. So you clearly have some connectivity there. One of the key factors behind the target attack was the fact that all the card reading hardware was the same across these stores. And it's that similarity of hardware that introduced the systemic risk. And that's even more true of software, given the dominant market share of certain operating systems. That commonality and the clone-like susceptibility to infection is a major systemic risk. We all use the same websites. Website traffic follows a power law distribution, so the top 20 most popular sites get 80% of the traffic, and so on, all the way up the stack, right up to the people at the top. All of you who are now listening to me are now connected in some way, for example, through the event registration database. So the point is not just that we have connectivity, but that we have it at every level of this technology stack. And that connectivity means systemic risk. If we look at the history of cyber incidents which have happened over the last 15 years, you can see that they're growing exponentially. You know, this is something that we're all aware of, and it's one of the reasons why the cyber insurance market is growing so fast. But bear in mind that these incidents are only reported if they're newsworthy. And there's a degree of underreporting which is going on. If you look here, you can see the blue line shows the incidents which are reported in the press. And it's only newsworthy if you're bigger than a billion dollars or so. So that's the blue curve going upwards. But when we look at the claims data, we can see that the number of attacks that are happening is actually far greater than that. The orange line here is showing the attacks and the claims which are coming through the claims data. And that shaded area between the two shows the degree of underreporting. And of course, it's even worse than that, because in order for it to show up in the claims data, people would have had to have had an insurance policy in the first place. And as we all know, medium to small sized companies are underinsured. Maybe only 5% of them have actually taken outside reinsurance. So basically, the situation is worse than the papers are reporting it. Which brings us on to our state of knowledge. Now, this is a very famous speech by Donald Rumsfeld back in 2002. And please forgive me, because I'm going to break good presentation protocol and actually read out exactly what it says on the slide. He said, reports that say that there's that something hasn't happened that are always interesting to me, because as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. It sounded completely incomprehensible now and then, and he actually won the Foot in Mouth Award from the Assembled Journalists because they couldn't figure out what the hell he was trying to say. But the reason why it's so confusing is that he's using the word known to mean two different things. Known, we are aware that it exists, and known that we can predict it or that we can quantify it in some way. And as soon as you separate out those two meanings, you end up with a set of quadrants like this. So you have the known knowns up there in the top left, things we are both aware of and able to quantify. And the unknown unknowns are down there in the bottom right. Those are the things we are unaware of, and so of course we can't quantify them. Unknown unknowns down there in quadrant three. And in quadrant two, we have the things where we are aware that they actually exist, but we are unable to quantify or predict them. And when you think about cyber risk, you can see that it's been moving in an anti-clockwise direction through these different quadrants. So back 15 years ago, cyber risk was in quadrant three. We were unaware of it, and we were not able to quantify it, of course, because we didn't even know that it was really there. Seven years ago, it was maybe moving into the known unknowns. We were aware of the scope of the risk, but we weren't able to quantify it that well. And the one upside of the increasing incidence of cyber attacks is that we're now moving more into quadrant one, that the data set is getting rich enough and big enough to be able to quantify the risk better. So you can see that we've been moving in an anti-clockwise direction around these three. Now, if you take the definition of security to be the degree to which your assets are resistant to threats from adversaries, and we take these different terms, assets, threats, and adversaries, and we stick them on our quadrants, then we end up with something a bit like this. 
So the adversaries belong down there in the unknown unknowns. We don't know who it is who's trying to attack us, and we may never know who it is who's trying to attack us. The threats belong in quadrant two. We are aware of how we might be attacked. It's just difficult to predict when and exactly who it's going to happen to. So they will be known unknowns. And then the assets basically belong up there in quadrant one. Hopefully, most companies are aware of the data which, if their competitors were to get hold of it, or if they were to lose access to it, or if it was to disappear in some way, that would damage their business significantly. So the assets, the crown jewels, are hopefully the known knowns. At least they should be. Most companies should have already figured out what it is they're trying to protect. But you'll notice that Donald Rumsfeld didn't mention in his analysis the fourth quadrant, the unknown knowns. So how can be something both unknown and known? Well, that's something that someone knows, but you don't know. And that's basically the impact side. And that's something which, if you think about the way that these quadrants are set out, is the area which it's probably best for you to be investing your time in. Because if you think about it, the unknown unknowns, well, you don't even know they exist, so what can you do? The known unknowns, you can't do anything about them because they're not quantifiable. The known knowns, well, hopefully you've already done that. So the best place to be focusing your time is quadrant four, the unknown knowns, the things you don't know but you should know. And that's where quantifying the potential of a cyber event on your organisation is probably the most productive thing you can try and do. Now, for the rest of the presentation, we're going to be working our way around these four quadrants. And we're going to start off down there in quadrant three with adversaries. Now, as I said before, the adversaries are the unknown unknowns. All the way back in 1872, Émile Dubois-Raymond gave a famous speech in Berlin about the shortcomings of science and the limits to our knowledge, titled Ignoramus et Ignorabimus, which is Latin for we do not know and we cannot know. 150 years later, this is still the best description of cyber adversaries. Ignoramus et ignorabimus. We may never know for sure who is trying to attack us because their identities are hidden behind so many proxy layers. We may have a strong suspicion and certain criminal groups have identifiable styles and methods, but making a link to an actual physical person is very hard. So we don't know who's trying to attack us and we'll probably never know. But there is one thing we do know about all those attacks, which is that they all tend to have something in common. And that is the element of human error or the human factor estimated to be the reason behind maybe 90% of cyber attacks which happen. And that's often expressed in this cartoon, which is a very famous one often put up in cyber risk presentations. The point it's trying to make is that you might have the most sophisticated systems in the world, but up against the stupidity of the human user, Dave, in this case, over in the corner, you don't stand a chance. But in many ways, that's far too simplistic. It's all too easy just to blame things on the stupidity of the user. And I want to dig into this subject a bit deeper by introducing two theories from economics to examine this phenomenon in a bit more depth. And the first of those is the famous Laffer curve. Some of you may be old enough to remember when this first came out. It was the era of Ronald Reagan, and this was the basis of Reaganomics and trickle-down theory. And Mr. Laffer observed that there's a maximal tax revenue that can be extracted from the citizenship. And his point was, as you can see here on the left, that the purple line going up is the tax rate, which is increasing from, let's say, 30% to 40% to 50%. And his point was that as the tax rate increases, the number of people paying tax actually decreases because it's worthwhile for people to invest in tax avoidance schemes or maybe move offshore or something like that. So there's a peak point at which even though you're raising your tax rate, the percentage of tax, the amount of revenue that you're collecting is actually going down. And that's the maximal tax revenue point at the top of the Laffer curve. Now, when we read across into cybersecurity, you can see that there's a similar effect at work, that you have increasingly strict security controls. That's the purple line going up. This is the tightness of the straitjacket you're trying to fit the users into. But as this gets tighter and tighter, the number of compliant users actually goes down. 
So you can see the blue curve there, the number of compliant users going down as you increase the strictures and the rules that you're expecting people to follow. And so that would imply that there's a maximal point of security too. Now, we all know that you can't have 100% security because you have to defend against every attack and the attacker only has to get through once in order to damage you. So we know we can't have 100%, but this would suggest that maybe you can't even have 60% because of that maximum security point, that after a certain point, you're increasing your security controls, but you're decreasing your resilience because of the Laffer curve effect. And so that would imply that, you know, IT security can only take you so far when it comes to cyber risk, reducing cyber risk, and that after that maximal security point, you need to rely on other departments inside the company, such as HR, which we'll come to later on, or maybe to insurance policies. And that's how you can get from 60% to 100%. The Laffer curve demonstrates that internet security is not just an IT problem. And the second economic theory that I want to bring in here to examine cyber risk is the so-called tragedy of the commons. Now this comes from medieval times when most villagers had the right to graze their cattle on the village green in the centre of the village. And after a time, all the grass disappeared. And the reason for that is that if you think from the individual standpoint, that imagine there's not that much grass left, it's still worth your while as an individual putting your cow on that green to graze it, because the benefits accrue 100% to you, but the costs are spread out over the community as a whole. So a tragedy of the commons is when all the grass disappears because you're in a situation where the benefits accrue to the individual, but the costs are spread out over the group. So pollution is a tragedy of the commons effect. If you dump your rubbish somewhere, you benefit and the environment suffers. The costs are borne by everyone else. The reason why there's hardly any fish left in the sea is also a tragedy of the commons effect, because it's still worth you going out and pulling the last fish out, because the benefit is completely to you and the costs are to everyone else. And when you think of cyber security, we have a similar situation. Cyber security is a tragedy of the common situation because the benefits of not following the rules accrue to the individual, but the cost is spread out over the group as a whole. So the real question is, how do you get out of a tragedy of the common situation? Well, there's two ways you can use the stick strategy, which would be a benefit to the group, but a cost to the individual, or a carrot strategy, where it's a benefit to both. Most security thinking up until now has been of the stick version. You need to do this, or else we'll fire you. But there's a growing appreciation that a carrot strategy works much better, that if you can come up with something which is a benefit both to the group and the individual, those rules are much more likely to be followed, and that's an example where maybe the HR department can make a significant contribution to cybersecurity by offering, let's say, an extra day's holiday or a bonus or a financial bonus of some sort for people who actually follow the rules properly and therefore use a carrot strategy rather than a stick strategy. You can see that a carrot strategy is likely to work much better and it's going to be a small price to pay for a big improvement in resilience. Now, we've been focusing up till now on accidental human error, but you also have deliberately malicious behavior from rogue employees who have some sort of grievance and are out to try to damage the company in some way. And if you look at the psychological literature on these rogue or malicious insiders, you'll find that they tend to have certain characteristics, certain common psychological profiles. They tend to be narcissistic Machiavellian psychopaths. I'm sure we all have some acquaintances are a bit like that, maybe even one of your ex-partners. But that's basically just putting all the blame on the individual. And the other side of the equation is to focus on what it is in the corporate culture which might promote this type of rogue employee behavior. And there are some interesting books on corporate psychology which have been written about this. And they tend to agree that there are certain elements in corporate culture which will promote this rogue employee behavior a bullying environment, broken promises where things have been said in the interview which didn't turn out to be true, hypocrisy, the difference between what's being said to the outside world and what's really happening inside, 
distrust between managers and employees, a sense of inequality that people are not being treated in the same way. All of these are factors that would promote malicious insiders to want to do some damage. And so here's a second way in which the HR department could actually contribute in a large way to cybersecurity by making sure that the corporate culture is not one that actually engenders that type of environment. You can also argue that rather than being stupid, the user is actually being very smart. Consider a big fish tank with an amoeba floating in it. This single cell creature needs heat, food and light. Imagine the heat comes from the top left, the light from the bottom right and the food from another direction altogether. That amoeba, with no brain and purely through instinct, will find the optimal point in the tank to maximise all three thus solving a complex multivariable optimization problem. Now consider an employee in a multinational company. Hopefully they do have a brain, but they are faced with a similar optimization problem. They often get conflicting messages from different quarters. The CEO's vision statement says put clients first, but the sales targets emphasize revenue first, and peer pressure may dictate a different direction altogether. Security rules and compliance guidelines are extra voices that may just add to the cacophony. Whatever the employee does to resolve those conflicts defines the firm's culture, which may be very different from the rules, but is in fact a smart response to a complicated problem. So rather than just accusing the user of being stupid because they don't follow the rules, a better approach is to ask why don't they follow the rules? What is the problem that they're trying to solve? that you might be unaware of? What are the other conflicting messages that they're responding to? What pressures are they trying to optimise? Seneca, the Roman philosopher, put it best when he said, rules do not persuade just because they threaten. OK, enough about the adversaries. Let's focus now a little bit on the threats. And let's start off with malware. Here I've got a diagram where I'm trying to illustrate the malware problem. And in the top diagram, you have PCs, and in the bottom, it's mobile devices. And in each case, the size of the bubble is the number of devices that exist, and the color of the bubble is how infected they are. So green is relatively uninfected, and anything which is red or purple is badly infected, as you can see in the key there. So basically, if it's big and it's red, it's bad news. So look first in the top left-hand corner, and you can see the USA bubble in the top and bottom diagrams are roughly the same size, around 200 million devices, 200 million PCs and 200 million mobile phones. And they're relatively clean in that the malware infection rates are actually quite low. Now look on the other side of the chart and you can see that there are actually eight times more mobile devices in China than there are PCs. And that ratio is even bigger when it comes to India so look at the difference between the two circles, top and bottom, for India. The point of this diagram is to say, well, most of us think cybersecurity and the malware threat is something to do with PCs in the developed world. But you can see here in terms of infection rates, it's actually all about mobile devices and all in those emerging markets. And when you think that China is the centre of world manufacturing and that India is the centre of world services in terms of outsourced services, is there a company in the world that doesn't buy some sort of device from China or outsource some of its services to India? Almost everyone does. And you can see with this picture that actually from a malware perspective, the danger is maybe not where you might have thought it was. Which brings us to the issue of measuring threats or the other side of the coin, measuring security. I want to take a more abstract step here and talk about the units we can use to measure cyber risk. I think we can define cyber risk in terms of three axes, the hierarchical, the lateral, and the temporal. These three axes create a 3D space inside which we can define cyber risk. The vertical or hierarchical axis is to do with top-down control or governance in its broadest sense. By this I mean anything to do with corporate procedures, compliance rules, operating manuals, response planning, and other policies, and such like. The lateral axis attempts to measure systemic risk and is concerned with connectivity and configuration. 
for example, network segregation, firewalls, encryption, and other factors to do with accessibility of the internal from the external. And lastly, but maybe most importantly, the third axis is time. The fundamental measure of security is time. We know we can't have 100% security, so in common parlance, it's only a matter of time. Reaction time, the speed of the OODA loop, if you will, is key. A system is secure if the time taken to identify and respond to attack is faster than the time it takes to penetrate it. In simplistic terms, a system is secure if it takes so long to crack the safe that the cops will arrive before the robbers have managed to open it. So the temporal axis is the third key element in our definition of cyber risk. At Axis, we use this type of 3D schema when we evaluate companies for insurance purposes. But I don't mean to diminish the risk that we face, and the analogy that I use when describing the difficulty in front of us, I like to call Eric Clapton's magic glove. So I want you to imagine that Eric Clapton has somehow managed to distill all 40 years of his amazing guitar playing ability and infuse it into a glove. And if you went and bought that glove for, let's say, 10 bucks and put it on your hand, you could suddenly play as well as the maestro himself. And you would become a guitar hero just by going out there and buying that glove. Now, of course, in the world of music, that's complete fantasy. But when it comes to the cyber world, that's not fantasy, because the tools you can go and buy on the dark web actually have managed to encapsulate the expertise of 40 years of experience from the best hackers out there and put it purely into a single tool that you can buy for a pittance and then use. So Eric Clapton's magic glove actually does exist when it comes to the cyber world. And when you think that a lot of risk or security analysis is based on the ideas of intent and capability, you know, a typical security audit would say, well, uh, there are people who wish me ill, but they don't have the capability to do anything about it. And then there are people who have the capability, but they don't wish me ill. And from this, you then draw up your intent versus capability risk matrix and see where you're most vulnerable. Well, the point about Eric Clapton's magic glove is that it shreds this type of risk analysis, because, of course, with that glove, everybody has the capability. The traditional barriers of entry of geography and knowledge don't exist in cyberspace. Anyone who does wish you ill can do something about it because these tools are so cheaply and freely available on the dark web. So we should really be thinking of this in economic terms again as the cost of these toolkits goes down and the amount of revenue you can actually extract using them from things like ransomware is going up, then you can see, economically speaking, that it makes sense for people to go out there and buy Eric Clapton's magic glove and use it to make money for themselves. It's as much an economic issue as a criminal one. Now, when it comes to cybersecurity, then a very easy sort of mental model to have is one of let's say, a medieval castle where you have your moat around the castle walls with the drawbridge, you know, that would represent the firewall, and you'd have your sentries walking up and down the battlements, and this would be your malware protection. And then you always have in a Hollywood movie the guy who says, ha-ha, I know the secret way in because there's a sewer that comes out the back, and there's a back door we can get in through without having to break the gates down, and that, of course, also exists in software as well. And the other well-known trope from these movies is that you hide underneath the straw in the cart that's basically bringing supplies into the castle and then jump out as soon as you're through the gates. That would be a Trojan attack. So you can see there's a lot of similarities between this type of castle model and cybersecurity. But the trouble is the castle model is now increasingly outdated because our ability to actually define where that wall exists is getting more and more difficult. This is the so-called deperimeterization problem, that when you think of how we work these days, a lot of people are now working from home, are those home computers inside the wall or outside the wall? Or take people using a cloud-based service, is that inside or outside the wall? Your ability to actually define your wall is getting more and more difficult. But a much better model for cybersecurity is to look at the human immune system. The beauty of the human immune system is it actually has two parts. There's the innate immune system, which is the same for everything. So this would be things like our skin barrier, 
our tonsils, for example, that catch any sort of infection from going down into our bodies. And that's basically the same for every virus which might be coming in. But the true beauty of the human immune system is the adaptive part of the immune system, which is specific to the different attacks which are coming in. It's all about the counterattack, the response, the body's own OODA loop. This is where your body will hopefully recognize the virus and then create antibodies and then create killer T cells targeted at that virus, which will come in and clean up the infection. And the steps that the human body goes through are exactly the same as the steps that a response to a cybersecurity incident goes through. And classically, they would be deter and delay, regardless of the type of attack. So deter and delay would be the innate part of the immune system. And then detect, respond, and recover. And this would be the adaptive part. And so these five steps are the steps which everyone takes when they're responding to a cyber attack. And this is where training with things like tabletop exercises are like a vaccination, training the body to respond. And as we said before, it's the speed of the response that is the key to cybersecurity. And the other analogy I like to use on the same theme when it comes to cybersecurity is the squid. Some of you may not know that in the Jurassic era, all squid had shells. So they looked like that Nautilus-type creature you can see over there on the left. But gradually the seas became more acidic, cells are made of calcium carbonate which dissolve in an acidic environment, and over time the squid lost its shell and had then to develop some other means of protecting itself, which wasn't to do with having a hard shell on the outside. It basically lost its castle wall, effectively. And the squid came up with three things, three ways to defend itself when it had no shell, and they were intelligence, camouflage and agility. Some of you may have seen a video on YouTube of an octopus learning how to unscrew a screw-top jar and get at the food inside. Squid and octopus are amongst the most intelligent creatures in the sea. And the second thing was camouflage. Of course, they can change their colour to match their background very easily and frequently. And the third thing was agility. Squid are very agile. They're effectively jet-propelled. They can suck water inside their bodies, which are no longer constrained by a shell, and squirt it out very fast so they can move and jump on their prey with this kind of jet propulsion attack. So intelligence, camouflage and agility, these are the three things that you can do if you lose your shell. And when we now look at how things are changing in cybersecurity, you can see that previously most of the investment, well 80% of it, was all on protection, i.e. on the shell. But this is now beginning to change, and that investment is going more into things like response, which is, of course, agility, and monitoring, which is, of course, intelligence. Monitoring and response are the two key components of the counterattack. And you may wonder, well, uh, what about the camouflage part? Why is that not on my diagram? Well, camouflage, uh, the point of camouflage is not to stand out and to blend into the background. The way in which you stand out in the cyber world is by having very out-of-date software. If you haven't patched your software, you stand out as a likely target. So, you know, imagine you were dressed in sort of Victorian clothing with a great big stovepipe hat like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln walking down the street. You would stand out like a sore thumb. If you're walking around with old clothes on, you know, Victorian clothes on, you'd be a very easy target. And it's the same if you're using old software. OK, let's move around the quadrants and now have a quick look at assets. As I said, hopefully, these are known knowns. The people have already figured out what it is that they're trying to protect. And when it comes to the security attributes of those assets, there's a well-known model which is known as the Confidentiality Integrity Availability Model, the CIA model. We use something slightly different, which is the Parkerian Hexad, which has an extra three elements to it, as you can see here. The blue ring on the inside there shows the security attributes that you're trying to protect, the security attributes of your assets. And there are three extra elements, which are utility, possession, and authenticity, which extend the original CIA3 while keeping to the general underlying themes of use, validity, and control. Now, the green ring around the outside shows the mechanism for protecting those assets, the security measures that you put in place. And then you have these purple triangles which show you the attacks which will be coming in against those security assets. So the Parkerian Hexad 
is kind of a fuller way of describing the security landscape. And the reason why I favour it is it also helps illustrate how insurance policies have developed over recent years. Because if your security controls, in green there, are the first defensive ring around your assets, then your insurance coverages are your second defensive ring, shown here in blue. The insurance cover that you can buy in the market these days is fairly comprehensive. Most policies out there will cover all these six areas. So for each of the security attributes of the assets you're trying to protect, there is a security control and an insurance cover. These two things fit together like a hand in a glove. So these days, when it comes to protecting your assets, you know, the insurance policies are there and they're pretty comprehensive and they can cover all aspects that you might be trying to protect against. OK, lastly, let's come to the impact quadrant. As I said before, probably the most important quadrant where you should be investing most of your time and energy, the unknown knowns, the things you don't know but you should know. Logically speaking, it's the only quadrant where you'll be able to get quantifiable benefits. To repeat what we said earlier, you can't do anything about quadrant three, the unknown unknowns, because you don't even know they exist. You can't quantify the known unknowns in quadrant two, and you've already sorted out the known knowns in quadrant one. So focus on quadrant four, the unknown knowns. What do we mean by an unknown known? It's knowledge that's known to someone in the organisation, but critically, not generally known by others who are making important decisions. We'll take a tabletop exercise, for example, a simulated disaster scenario where people from many different departments are sitting around the table. Each one has specialist knowledge, known to themselves, but not to others. The point of the tabletop exercise is to make that implicit knowledge explicit, to make sure that the knowledge is spread to everyone, that the unknown becomes known to everyone who needs to know it. So, for example, uh, what impact will shutting down key parts of the network have on the sales department? Uh, or how long might it take to get things up and running? Or uh, what are the HR implications of a hunt for a malicious insider? Or what needs to be communicated internally and externally? And are there any legal concerns with that? By rehearsing a crisis and enshrining agreed responses in an incident response plan, you will eliminate unnecessary interdepartmental arguments and make everyone aware of their roles and responsibilities in the event of a crisis. Focusing on the impact quadrant also brings benefits when it comes to financial planning. If you know how much a breach might cost, that will inform your IT security budget and the amount of insurance cover you might like to take out. Now, when it comes to how much a cyber breach might cost, well, you know, how long is a piece of string? And here's one piece of string which comes from the Ponemon report, just under 500 companies. Uh, of course, the figures are all averaged out, and you can see typically what a cyber event might cost. But, you know, it's difficult to put too much credence in those figures because, of course, this includes big companies and small companies from all sorts of different sectors. And these things tend to be quite sector-specific, Different industries have very different risk profiles, and so do different countries. Those average figures are not that useful because you really have to do this on a bottom-up basis because every company is different, both in size and in industry. So here's a very, very simple model. If you're trying to figure out what a cyber breach might cost, at least a starting point would be this. With only three pieces of information, we can come up with a pretty good estimate. And those three pieces of information are the revenue, the headcount, and the number of customers. Let's explain the model a little bit. In any sort of cyber attack, there's always going to be a bunch of fixed costs. The day rate of the forensic guys you're hiring to come in is pretty much the same based on the number of days. But there are three things which will basically scale, three elements of cost which will scale with those three factors. First, when it comes to business interruption, well, that's going to be some sort of scalar based on revenue. Profits would be more accurate, but revenue is easier to get hold of because basically, if you're down for a certain period of time, then you can figure out what the lost revenue and therefore the lost profits might be. Secondly, when it comes to the restitution costs, that's going to scale with the size of your IT estate, for which the number of PCs is a fairly good proxy. 
and that of course is based on your head count, particularly in the white collar area. So the number of PCs is a good proxy for restitution costs. And lastly, the number of customer records. Remember that it's not just regulatory fines that you might have to pay, having lost a large number of records, but also the notification costs and the monitoring costs. And that, of course, is based on the number of customers you have. So with just these three things, headcount, number of customers and revenue, <clears throat> this is information which is fairly easily available for almost all companies which are out there. You can come up with a pretty good first step in terms of estimating what a cyber event might cost. It's just a first step, of course, and a very simple model, but it'll give you a first approximation which can be refined later. And remember, these costs are typically paid by your insurance policy, along with the appointment of an external incident response expert to help you navigate through the crisis. And that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening. And if you found this interesting, just to remind you again, you can go and download the book 35 Views of Cyber Risk from the Net Diligence event website or from our Access website. Again, thanks for listening. All the best and keep safe. Okay, so it's time for some uh, questions. I've got a bunch of questions which people have been asking, uh, and I'll just read some of those out and then maybe come up with my with my answers. Uh, so I have a question here from uh, Douglas Morano. Um, he asked me, on the change in the future of cybersecurity investment, is it that entities are shifting resources away from prevention, or is it that they are adding more resources to response and monitoring? Um, it's the second. Uh, so that's the area which is being boosted, as I was as I was mentioning. If you remember that slide just after the uh, the squid, that's where that's where we're seeing the biggest increases. Although there's one curious thing about um, cyber uh, insurance, if you if you look, uh, for example, in property, um, then the amount people spend on protecting property and the amount people spend on insuring property are roughly the same. So you have a you have a sort of similar spend by companies on 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 security for property and insurance. When you look at those figures in cyber insurance, then the value of the um, cyber security market is about 120 billion, uh, but the value of the cyber insurance market is only about nine billion or something. So you you actually have a massive um, disparity between the amount people are spending on defence and insurance. So even though the one area which is growing fastest is actually uh, response and monitoring, um, you know, relatively speaking, the amount which is being spent on insurance is also very low, and that's an area where we would also expect to see uh, 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 quite a lot of growth. Um, and I think that also leads into, uh, I've got another question here. Um, someone's asking, um, you said that the fundamental measure of security is time. Uh, can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. So, so, so when you think about the, you know, coming back to those three things, so the sort of prevention, the monitoring, and response. Um, if you look outside the cybersecurity arena, um, you know, think for example of a retail shop. Um, then the sort of prevention on a retail shop is really just a pane of glass, uh, you know, which you can smash in, um, you know, five seconds. Uh, so retail shops rely almost wholly on monitoring and response. Uh, monitoring would be like um, you know checking the CCTV cameras, and response would be you know the alarm going off. Um, so so you can see that the that the equation is really as long as the time it takes to um, steal something is longer than the time it takes to detect it and respond to it. Um, then you can say that something is secure. I don't know of any other way of kind of measuring security, um, really, uh, other than that. Um, we have another uh, question here. Um, you were talking about malicious insiders uh, and mentioned that there were some books about how corporate culture can create those types of rogue individuals. Do you have any recommendations of books to read on that? Um, 
I think probably the the best one that I've read is one which is called um, Bad Apples uh, by uh, John Taylor, who used to be um, in the uh, British intelligence services. Um, and that's one where he goes through um, the psychology of what makes somebody um, into a rogue uh, insider. It came out quite a long time ago. I think it's, it's maybe 10 years old, um, but it's still uh, it's still really good. It's called Bad Apples um, by John Taylor and um, Adrian Furnham, I think. Um, <clears throat> I've got another one here. It basically says, uh, what do you mean when you say we don't have to worry about ransomware because, of evolution, because evolutionary pressure favors the prey? It doesn't feel like that at the moment. <laughs> I guess, I mean, you know, ransomware is clearly one of the things which we're all most worried about. But I guess the the, the, the point of my my argument um, is kind of, you know, the worse it feels right now, then the better it's going to get. Uh, you know, because if you do believe that we're it's actually a cyclical uh, phenomenon rather than a straight line phenomenon, then that you have at times when the attackers are in the ascendancy and then the defenders and you actually have a predator-prey cycle happening, then, then the you know the greater the predation, the greater the recovery will be if you believe that it's cyclical. Although I do, you know, that's that's kind of rather a, a theoretical answer. It, it actually it, it reminds me there's a there's another joke about um, about um, two theoretical economists who are walking down the street, and one of them says to the other, "I say, old boy, uh, look, there's a twenty pound note um, lying on the pavement right there," and the other economist says. No, dear boy, uh, if you know anything about supply and demand, then it can't possibly be there, because if it was there, someone would have already picked it up. So I guess the point is there that, you know, in theory, you would say we would expect the cycle to be turning soon. Um, and, and, you know, the, the darker it gets, the more likely that that, that turn is going to happen. Um, then I have one here uh, saying, um, in your analysis of first order and fourth order complex systems, where does the current coronavirus epidemic sit? Uh, what order of complexity is that? Um, so uh, coronavirus, that would be second order uh, because we've moved out of physics into into biology. But you know the, the virus doesn't have any intelligence, so it wouldn't be up at, 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 the, at the fourth level. Um, and you know one of the key points to make there is that you do have um, Darwinian evolution happening. So you're still in a dynamic environment, and you know typically viruses tend to mutate to become less deadly over time. Um, if you look at the past history, I'm you know I'm not not sure if there's any evidence of that for coronavirus yet. But typically speaking, viruses start off very deadly and then mutate over time, because uh, you know they, because if they if they kill too many people, then they can't be transmitted. So they normally find uh, a sort of happy, uh, less virulent form. Uh, uh, over time. Um, so, yeah, uh, coronavirus would be fourth order complex. Um, and then, uh, let me see, uh, we have uh, okay, looking, uh, sorry, I was able to see if the last ask, ask was, was recorded, it wasn't recorded, I'm sorry about that. Um, do I have a model that includes medical equipment? Um, I'm not quite sure uh, what you mean there. Do, do you mean uh, do we do when we when we are um, insuring uh, healthcare type companies? Uh, do we do we look at uh, medical equipment as part of our cybersecurity uh, evaluation? Um, Yes, we do. I mean, that's that's one of that's one of the areas, of course, which is of great concern to us. We're basically, you know, we're moving there maybe more into the uh, Internet of Things arena. Uh, but yes, I mean, uh, one of the points is that you know, cyber risk isn't uh, or it is very sector dependent. Um, so for each particular industry, there's a different different set of uh, risks, and you shouldn't really use some sort of um, one size fits all approach because you have to think of things that very much on an individual basis. And I think that brings me pretty much to my time. Uh, thank you again for listening. And remember, you know, please download the book if you're interested in reading it. Uh, and feel free to email me um, if you had any other questions or you'd like to get in touch to talk about
So uh, thank you all very much.